hello. My name is Natalie Battaglia. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz. And I worked for about 20 years at NASA Ames Research Center on a mission called Kepler, which um, flew in order to find potentially habitable Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars out in our galaxy. I'm happy to be here as part of this special session on the origin of life on Earth and beyond. I'll be talking about these planets orbiting other stars and specifically about their diversity. Um, the plurality of worlds is usually invoked to mean that life must exist beyond the solar system simply because of the real estate that's available. There are so many stars and presumably so many planets. But I've started thinking about plurality in terms of the lack of consensus or a lack of a majority because I've come to appreciate the great diversity of exoplanets out in the galaxy. So this is what the scene looked like in 2009 on the eve of the launch of NASA's Kepler mission. Uh, there were less than 200 planets known at that time, and 90% of them were larger than Neptune. Fast forward eight years and 4,000 discoveries, and we have the yellow points in this diagram, which are the Kepler discoveries. Now, about 90% of the planets known to humans are smaller than Neptune. So the scene has changed dramatically. But there's also a quite a bit of information in this scatter plot of planet radius versus orbital period two of the measurables um, in our planet detection mission. Uh, first, you might notice that there's an absence of planets down here at the bottom, and that's simply because we lack the sensitivity to see them. That's an observational bias. But there's another lack of planets up here um, that is actually quite significant, and that we call the Neptune Desert. And that's related to a physical process whereby the envelopes of planets get stripped or evaporated. Um, there are other features. For example, there's a clump of hot giant planets over here and another clump of cold giants over here. Um, the hot giants tell us that planets move around. They, they uh, change their angular momentum of their orbits early in the formation of planetary systems. The cold giant planets tell us that planets are more common once you go far away from the star, or giant planets are more common as you get further away because you reach environments where the temperatures are low enough for various ices to condense out and add to the masses of these planets and also add to the hydrogen envelopes. The point being that there is a lot of structure here which tells us um, important, gives us important clues about the physical processes underlying planet formation. But we can convert these, this observed sample of planets into a calculation of the actual occurrence of planets out in the galaxy. And when we do that, we find that on average, every sun-like star has at least one exoplanet. That was the one of the major takeaways from the Kepler mission. And it is a demographics mission. It was aim was to study the demographics of exoplanets, and we can break that down as a function of the, the, the bulk properties that we measure. For example, in the solar system, if we were to take all, the, all of the radii or sizes of objects in the solar system and create a distribution, we would find this beautiful power law distribution. Um, as you go from uh, asteroids the size of Vesta that are something like a thousand kilometers in size, all the way down to objects like Gaspra, which are more like one kilometer in size, you see this very nice power law distribution. And what we would like to do is extend that to planetary sizes, um, but you can't do that with just one planetary system. But now fast forward with Kepler, we can, because now we have thousands of planets and, and planetary systems. And so we create a histogram like this one 
that is appropriately corrected for observational biases, but actually what we find is that the distribution is not a power law. The power law behavior is not extended when you go to planetary sizes. Um, it looks like it is as you go from Jupiter sizes down to Neptune sizes and up to about two and a half times the size of the Earth, but then you get a bifurcation and you end up with a bimodal distribution of small planets. So we can take information like this and we can give it to our theoreticians who build models and investigate the physical processes that are going on under the hood. And they can study the process of planet formation from planetesimals as they grow into rocky cores of different sizes, right? Dictated by the different um, mass densities of the disks from which they form. Um, then there's a process whereby these planetary cores accrete gas, hydrogen gas, which is very abundant in the protoplanetary disks. They do that with varying efficiencies depending on their surface gravities. Um, and they are also subjected to heat, um, internal heat, yes, but really the, it's the stellar environment that is having a great impact on sculpting these envelopes of hydrogen-rich material. So where a planet forms in the protoplanetary disk is going to dictate whether or not that planet's going to be able to retain the hydrogen envelope. And all of these processes corroborate to create these two distributions, that of the mini Neptunes and of the super Earths. So by studying these processes and the demographics that allow us to hypothesis test these theories, we can gain a better understanding of the diversity of small planets and why that diversity exists and what the implications are for life. Here's another observational diagnostic that we have, um, the mass radius relationship. These are also bulk properties that we measure um, for exoplanets. In a subset of the cases, we can get both mass and radius. If we plot those values for solar system planets, we find yet again a nice power law. Here it looks like a straight line in my log log plot. But when I add exoplanet discoveries, the situation is not so well behaved. The, the white points in the background are all of the exoplanets that have both of these bulk properties measured. And you can see that they are widely varying. They, they more or less follow a relation, but there um, is a scatter represented by those points that, is, that exceeds their measurement uncertainties. And um, I have added some lines here to show different compositional mixes. These lines say, okay, I've got a certain, I assume a certain recipe for a planet in a certain, with a certain mass, and now I double, triple, quadruple the recipe. How does that change the radius? And we plot these things using different mixes and compositions. And um, in this particular diagram, everything from a solid iron planet to a solid hydrogen planet, neither of which exist in nature likely, um, but it's very illustrative to show that the exoplanets are spanning that entire breadth. So we have a compositional diversity that we have to explain um, and physical processes that are operating that probably we don't have to consider um, in our own solar system. Okay, so going forward, um, we want to understand the implications for life. And in order to do this, we're going, what we'd like to do is map the volatiles, the volatiles are the elements and the molecules that end up in an atmosphere. Um, molecules like carbon dioxide um, or, or methane, for example, common greenhouse gases or water vapor, um, all of which are going to tell us whether or not it's even possible for that small planet to be a truly habitable environment um, like we have here on Earth. So um, we want to track the volatiles from the galactic chemistry, the chemistry of the giant molecular cloud, the chemistry of the protoplanetary disk that is created from which planets form, the nascent planets themselves as they evolve, 
Um, and then finally, the planetary system, we want to know how those volatiles get locked up inside the planet and eventually outgassed into the atmosphere of the planet that creates the conditions um, on the surface for life. We can do that thanks to um, new tools that are available. Um, well, tools that are available um, that are existing and new tools that are coming online. ALMA, for example, is a ground-based network of radio telescopes, actually millimeter wave telescopes. ALMA stands for the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And this is a gallery of the amazing imagery that has come out of ALMA. Very, very high resolution that's required to get these images of protoplanetary disks where planets are in the process of forming. Um, on the left-hand side, you see um, protoplanetary disks, you see the ring structures due to the presence of likely presence of planets, spiral density wave structure, um, evidence of the dynamical processes that are operating to form those planets. Um, if we can take the light from objects like this and um, use it to compute compositional abundances, one of those molecular abundances um, that's very interesting to us is carbon monoxide, for example. Um, we would like to understand from the disks what the uh, ratio is of carbon to oxygen, um, because we think that if we can measure the carbon to oxygen ratio in an exoplanet, we will be able to tell exactly where the planet formed in the disk. And that gives us an additional piece of information that is part of the story of the planet and tells us about its diversity or what to expect in terms of a habitable environment. In terms of the atmospheres, we're going to study atmospheres by observing planets that are backlit and frontlit. Um, in the upper row, you see three objects, a woman's silhouette, a cloud, and the planet Venus backlit by a light source. Um, when Venus is lit be from behind, some of the starlight is going to filter through the Venusian atmosphere. And you can just barely see the Venusian atmosphere projected against the blackness of space. You see a very thin yellow line. Um, that's the Venusian atmosphere. Of course, it extends all the way around. And some of the starlight filters through that atmosphere, which will then impart its chemical fingerprint on the light and allow us to not only get compositional abundances like the abundance of CO2, um, but also map out the pressure temperature structure of the atmosphere and other diagnostics. So that's the specific case of transmission. Um, we call this a transiting planet. Venus here is transiting. Oops running out of space. So transmission, I'll just write. Venus is transiting in front of its parent star and we're observing the atmosphere in transmission. On the bottom, we see the um, frontlit objects, the woman's face, the face of the cloud, the face of the planet. Now we see Venus in reflected light. Um, and whether the light is being reflected or is being emitted as thermal emission from the planet itself, in both of those situations, light is passing through the atmosphere and imparting its, imparting, and the atmosphere is imparting the same chemical fingerprint. Um, this scenario down here to observe front lit planets, this is called direct imaging. In order to see that, you have to be able to resolve and distinguish um, the star from the planet itself, which requires very specific technology that's being developed. This has been done for a small handful of planets and will be done um, a lot in the future. For now, we are working mostly on planets in transmission. And an example of that is with the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has actually observed transiting planets and studied their atmospheres. We, from that, we've studied their atmospheres in transmission. 
On the left-hand side, you see a collection, a catalog of planetary spectra that were taken by David Singh and his group and published in 2016. This is a collection of giant planets. You see water features that have been measured. Um, the colored lines are the models that give the abundances of those water molecules, for example. On the right-hand side, we see the same thing for a smaller wavelength window for um, warm Neptunes. Um, and you see also detections of water features in some of these Neptunes, um, going down to the cooler Neptunes where hazes begin to become important because you get condensates that actually contribute to the atmosphere and produce radicals that can be strung together in more complex molecular chains um, that produce hazes that obscure the features, prevent us from seeing deep down into the atmosphere and, and seeing those features in absorption. Um, which is a problem that we're going to have to struggle with um, and understand better as we understand these exoplanets. Um, in terms of the future, we have tools coming online, new tools. For example, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launching at the end of next year. Um, Webb has a 6.5 meter aperture as opposed to the two meter aperture of the Hubble Space Telescope. So it has higher sensitivity, um, but it's also designed to, op to, to operate in the infrared um, in a much wider wavelength range than we have for Hubble. Um, Webb will operate from one micron all the way out to 10 microns and give us windows of opportunity for additional molecular species like methane, for example. The 30 meter telescope that's depicted on the right is one of three um, such telescopes that are currently under design and or construction. Two of them are located in the Southern Hemisphere and the 30 meter telescope, the TMT, um, will one day hopefully be located in the Northern Hemisphere um, with a location to be determined. Um, the 30 meter telescope is going to be capable of resolving uh, planets orbiting M type stars, for example. And we hope that it will have the sensitivity and the dynamic range to be able to um, observe those planets in the front lit scenario that we were talking about before or in their thermal emission. Okay, but first we need to find the planets that are closest to the Earth. Um, so orbiting stars that are very bright, um, the nearby planets are going to be easier to study for many different reasons. Um, here, what I'm showing is a polar projection of discoveries of all the transiting exoplanets to date. And uh, you see this yellow spray of planets going down to the bottom right. Those are the planets that were discovered by the Kepler spacecraft. Kepler spent four years staring at just one patch of sky. The circle here is a circle of coordinates. Right ascension, which is one of the coordinates that coordinate systems that astronomers use. And then the radial direction is mapping the distance out into the galaxy to the planet from zero to 6,000 light years. So these are all of the known transiting planets um, that we can study in transmission. And there is a new NASA spacecraft called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, which has been searching for nearby transiting planets. Really, we want planets um, orbiting stars within 100 light years to study their atmospheres. And that's the dot right at the very middle. So let's zoom in there. There's the 100 light year radius circle. And those are all the transiting planets within 100 light years. There aren't that many, just a couple of dozen. And TESS has contributed now about a half of them. In just its less than two years of operation, TESS has already discovered multiple planets, many planets orbiting stars within 100 light years that can be subjected to atmospheric characterization, um, which is very exciting. I think that the next decades of exoplanet science are going to be really characterized by atmospheric studies, um, giving us another window into the diversity of exoplanets. 
So what else can we do with these atmospheric studies? This is another um, plot of kind of bulk properties. The metallicity that I'm, I'm referring to here actually refers to the mass fraction of all elements heavier than hydrogen. And if you measure that for our solar system planets, as you go from Jupiter to Saturn to Uranus and Neptune, the mass fraction of heavier elements actually increases. And it's not because we have more heavy elements, it's because you have less hydrogen, because you're measuring that relative to hydrogen. Um, so what that is telling us is that planets like Jupiter, um, with their massive hydrogen envelopes, um, have this lower mass fraction compared to planets like Uranus and Neptune. And we wanna know if that trend generally holds for other planets out in the galaxy. And that's what's being shown by these blue points. These blue points represent metallicity measurements for other exoplanets. And again, here too, you see that they roughly follow the trend line. Huge error bars on these metallicity measurements. There's one exception over here with relatively small error bars that's hinting at some kind of a diversity, um, but with a sample of one, we can't be sure. The good news is that Webb is going to not only have very small error bars because of its larger aperture mirror, but it's also going to be able to extend us down to smaller planets. So we'll be able to see if this trend extends all the way down to the sub-Neptunes and, and super-Earths that we were talking about earlier. This is a simulation of, of the spectrum, the planetary spectrum of a giant planet. Um, two simulations actually, one with the Hubble Space Telescope in gray, and then the red is the James Webb Space Telescope. And you see that the Webb spell, uh, Telescope spans a much broader wavelength range with access to numerous molecular species that we can measure. Um, whereas Hubble spanned a much smaller wavelength region. And so when you compute the metallicity or the carbon to oxygen ratio that we um, were talking about with the disks, the protoplanetary disks, um, here we have two plots in the bottom and, and probability distribution functions in, in for, for both simulations. The gray probability distribution is the metallicity and then the C to O ratio that's recovered using the Hubble data alone. And the red is that using the web data. And you see that the probability distribution function becomes extremely sharp, very narrow error bars using web. So we're going to get order of magnitude improvements in the C to O and metallicity uh, measurements with or using web compared to Hubble. And that's very exciting. We should be able to extend this in some cases to smaller planets. Um, in particular, there is a planetary system called TRAPPIST-1. Um, in fact, I can back up and show you where that resides here. This green point right there is a planetary system called TRAPPIST-1 that is actually seven planets orbiting one star. And it's colored green because it has three planets that are in the Goldilocks zone or um, orbiting at distances where liquid water could exist on the surface of those planets. And it's very close. It's within 40 light years. So um, this is a very exciting planet to study. Um, it also has this characteristic that it orbits a very small M-type star, which makes it easier to observe its atmospheric diagnostics. So this is a simulation of what we might get um, with Webb observing a planet like TRAPPIST-1 or some of the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Um, here is what has been done with Hubble. These gray points have already been, um, we, we do have some observations that have already been taken with Hubble. And the cyan is what we can get with Webb. Again, huge payoff from the wide wavelength range. Now we have access to methane, CO2, um, in addition to water. 
and down here we've got the same probability distribution functions, both for the water composition and the methane composition. So here too, um, we've got a, a window of opportunity for the very first detection of an atmosphere with web of a temperate terrestrial sized planet. So we can look at the solar system for um, a mosaic or a composite of many different spectra of, of, um, of planets. Here we've got from terrestrial planets or even smaller all the way up to the giant planets Jupiter and Saturn and you see their spectra plotted on top, their reflection spectra on top. And Earth in this case stands out like a sore thumb because it's a living world. Um, and what we would like to do is look or have a demographic sample of like, thi uh, like this beyond the Earth so that we can see if that trend holds true. When we get hundreds of planetary spectra, especially of Earth-sized planets, will the living worlds stick out like a sore thumb like, it like Earth does in the solar system? We don't know the answer to that question yet, but what we've seen both from demographic studies as well as preliminary atmospheric studies, it looks like the diversity of Earth-sized planets is much larger than we see in our own solar system. So that remains to be seen and is work to be done uh, in the future. So with that, I will end. I have a series of takeaway messages here from my talk that you can pause and read on your own time. Um, I want to uh, encourage you to stick around and or watch the other talks in this special session. Hillary Hartnett is going to talk about the sources and sinks of chemical and biological signatures in, in an Earth system. Tori Holer is going to talk about the prospects for life in our own solar system. And David Deemer is going to uh, tell you what we know so far about the origin of life. So thank you very much. Very much. Um, stay tuned with Exoplanet Science. It's going to be an exciting few decades. Take care.